five thirty. I'd like to call the meeting of the University of Central Village Board of Education to order. Let's start with the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please, Mrs. 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 I try to just say how nice it is to see everybody. <laughs> it's a lot easier to take a motion in person than trying to manage an online thing. <laughs> um, forgive me for having to read this, but I had some comments that I wanted to share and um, for the audience as well as for anybody that's watching um, online tonight. Um, and this is regarding the reopening of the Amherst schools. Um, the schools actually um, fielded an online survey to gain feedback from our families regarding the reopening of our schools. We appreciated all the feedback and will continue to use that information as we plan for the 2021 school year. The vast majority of the Amherst families in that survey stated that they were ready to go back to a physical return of school while there were others who preferred to keep their children at home to do remote learning. Taking that feedback and guidance from the Lorain County Public Health and State into account, our district plans to open our buildings back up on August 20th with a traditional seven hour a day, five day per week schedule. Families who are not comfortable with this will be able to opt into a remote learning option from their home. We will be announcing specific district building and remote learning plans during the final week of July via email, our website, social media, and other means. In the interim, district leaders will continue to work with the Lorraine, Health, excuse me, Lorraine County Health Commissioner, David Kogo, in observance and observe all the guidance that we're getting from the state. Our school principals are working with our staffs at the individual building level to create their plans and this would include plans for transportation, lunch, recess, students with special needs, visitors, and more. As recommended by the Lorain County Public Health, all planning will center on these five themes. Distancing, hand washing, screening and assessing symptoms, sanitizing and cleaning district properties, and wearing face coverings. This has been and will be a challenging time for all, but we're fully dedicated to providing high quality education for all of our students while minimizing and mitigating the risk of COVID-19 to our students and staff. We thank everyone for their feedback, as well as your support and patience during this unprecedented time. And now, I'm not sure, did anybody sign up for hearing the public? No. No? Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll move on with our agenda then. Start with the treasurer's report, Mrs. Giafrida. Good evening, board. It's nice to see everybody in person. <clears throat> um, as you were provided in the update, um, we closed the fiscal year, um, fiscal 2020, um, on July 2nd. And um, I did provide some highlights, but it's worthy of mentioning um, in this evening. Last year, we finished. Um, the year was nearly $225,000 greater than what was um, anticipated. Um, greater revenue than last year, excuse me, um, despite the slash state foundation. Um, salaries um, were slightly over the May forecast. Um, benefits were slightly less by, say, $15,000. Purchase services were over the forecast. Supplies came in under the May forecast. Um, capital came in under the May forecast. That really was due to timing on pay applications for um, 
either the remainder of what is owed on the new powers elementary and the concession stand project. Um, but those numbers remain in encumbrances and will carry over to this fiscal year 21. Um, uh, other expenditures came in less than the May forecast. Um, other financing, if you recall, other financing um, contains two line items, transfers from the general fund and advances from the general fund. And um, we were lucky enough not to have to uh, do any advances to the federal grants this year. I was able to do the, um, to complete the project cash request um, by the deadline of June 12th. We received those monies in, so we were at zero or greater for every one of the federal grants, which is really nice. Um, and then we had projected deficit spending um, of one fourteen million, um, but our deficit spending was actually less than one hundred thousand dollars. So that is that is really nice. Um, just to kind of recap, of course, in May we do the five-year forecast update, and. Um, the only things that we really changed in the five-year forecast from the November forecast to the May update were things that we absolutely knew, which was our what our state foundation cut was going to be. Of course, our real estate um, and public utilities both came in over a forecast. Um, we never changed anything with salaries and benefits for the May forecast. We kept those at the November forecasted amount, and of course, we were very close. We are probably one-tenth of a percent um, off by those. So I just wanted to update you in open session. Um, I have provided to you um, the five-year forecast line item detail. It's really not the forecast. It looks more like a P&L with revenues at the top and expenditures at the bottom. I've compared fiscal 20 to the two prior years, both on the month to date and a fiscal to date basis. Um, you can see what's um, gone on with our cash balances or building uh, cash balances very slowly, but maintaining that, which is good. And then the June 2020 forecast line item report, this is a report that Mr. Sayers really likes. So I thought I would present it to the board um, so you can see the recap for the, for the full fiscal year. Um, but I do believe that I attached the May report in my July 2nd update, so my apologies for not having the correct one in front of you. So um, that concludes my report for this evening. Um, did anybody have any questions on that? If, if I could just follow up, if, if that's okay, I, and I may have communicated this before, but uh, I think it certainly bears repeating uh, and sharing with the board. Um, that the Ohio Department of Education, and it's a good time to do this now at the end of the fiscal year, uh, and one of the best practices of the Ohio Department of Education is that they recommend a minimum of one to two months worth of expenditures to be held in cash reserve. And here's the recommendation you know, from the ODD website. Our board policy actually takes that a step further and our board policy requires that we always have 90 days or three months uh, worth of expenditures in cash reserve. And uh, in actuality, the way we finish the fiscal year, we actually have almost six months or 180 days uh, in cash reserve. So I wanted to uh, share that uh, just you know, to kind of reinforce how we are going far above and beyond what the OPE recommends in terms of uh, financial best practices. And it's also especially appropriate that we talk about it now because that's the kind of thing that's going to help us weather the financial storm that we find ourselves in uh, with the reductions in state funding and, and that type of thing. So I just thought it was timely to, you know, to, to reiterate that information. Yeah. Well, explain why are we seeing the then and the now? So is that is that because we are entering into contracts or someone's entering into contracts prior to getting a PO issue? Or what, why is that all of a sudden we're seeing almost every meeting we're seeing those which in the past we haven't seen? Those. What's causing that? Well, first of all, um, Ohio Revised Code dictates that any any invoice that is presented to the treasurer for which we do not have a purchase order. Um, Ohio Revised Code states that that goes to the board for approval, right? Yep. Stating that 
um, the budget was free from encumbrance, and any monies to the general fund were in the process of collection or had already been collected. So that's the first thing. I'm not going to approve anything as the treasurer, for which I do not have the latitude by the state of Ohio, right? right? So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is we are at the beginning of the fiscal year. So these are, uh, for instance, FTG is our copier contract. Our copier company has, has um, changed names a number of times in the last couple of years. Um, so that's something, the copier contract, that was approved by the board, at, I believe, over two years ago because it was, it was before I started. So the district, the board, has approved the expenditure for monthly copier costs. So you've already approved that part of it, right? Mm -hmm. But with the beginning of the fiscal year, the purchase order was not in place at July 1st. That's very often the case. Some districts don't open the new fiscal year until about the time we're in right now. But we had to have budgets built and um, we had to modify the budgets a bit before that purchase order was put in. Um, so that's why you're seeing that the invoice was dated prior to the purchase order. But that is now a super length purchase order, which will cover the entire fiscal year's lease. So we shouldn't be seeing this again. The next one is frontline. Frontline um, is our absence tracking, and it's also our um, AppleTrack, which is how we track our applications from um, posting the vacancy all the way um, through uh, submission of their um, application materials, excuse me. So again, same situation with FTG. Budgets um, may not have been in place to be able to encumber the entire amount of the um, obligation to the vendor. So, lengthy answer, but it's multi part It's an issue of getting the invoices and sent with people. <laughs> yes. On the FTG one, I, you, I see there's a, is there a past new month, 1196, was that just a crossover? The amount of looking to be approved, there's a 12,095, but the invoice is 13,291. I would need to, you know, look at the invoice again, which I don't have. Yeah, the invoice shows past due charges eleven ninety six sixty five total amount due thirteen thousand two ninety one sixty five. This is this is a twelve thousand one ninety five. Maybe the eleven eleven hundred is just already paid. It was just a matter of just showing up on the invoice. It has. That's what I'm guessing it is. It, it definitely has been paid. I can yeah. assure you that right. we had twelve months of copier lease expenditure in fiscal right. twenty. But what I can tell you is this is a vendor that nearly every month we have difficulty with the invoice. They, they, are, they are very, um, they take a long time to post our payments, and then they also don't invoice us on the same day every month. So often our accounts payable department is calling over to the vendor trying to get an invoice. Um, we often have late charges, not of our own making, Right. But due to invoicing issues and such, so we're always on top of this particular um, monthly lease. Is that a vendor we can summon at some point get rid of if they continue to do this? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I, 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 in my business, I've had that those issues with vendors. Just I, I take it to the end of the contract and they're out. I, I just won't renew them. Copier and um, the copiers are contracts. They're notorious. Yeah, they're they're notorious for being difficult um, contracts to manage. Um, so, at some point here in the next few years, we will certainly be in a position to um, go out for a quote um, and, and look at other vendors as well. So, does that answer your question? Yes, I'm good. Yep. That, but you had two questions. So. You, you answered both. Okay, very good. <laughs> anything else? Hearing nothing else, I'll take a motion for treasurer's recommendations 7A through E. No. No. E is the second one. I'm sorry. D, right? Yes, seven D for okay. seven D, please. Okay, so so okay. Sorry, I missed that. It's okay. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually B needs to be by itself, please. Which one? Is e. And B. B. <clears throat> recommendation seven A. C 
and B, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, good. Okay, roll call for 7A, C, and D. Mr. Amkamosi? Aye. Mrs. Gellis? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. I'll take a motion for her treasurer's recommendation. 7B. So moved. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Engel? Steen. Mr. Zappa? Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mr. Jacobosi? Aye. And Mrs. Snyder? Aye. So do you want to discuss E? Yes. 70, um, you'll see in the exhibit, is a very lengthy, very lengthy resolution. Um, it's heavily statutory. Um, we've seen one very, very similar to it when the district issued bonds for the new towers elementary. Um, this $5 million issue, however, is for the Cambridge Public Library. We are moving forward with issuing bonds, hopefully this month or early next month. Um, for the bond issue that passed in March. And this is the final resolution that the board will see in order to proceed with the issue of the bonds. I will certify this resolution, send it on to non council, and um, in background, all of us, the school district, the library, um, the bond underwriter, um, the bankers, and bond council are all working on the preliminary official statement, which will become the official statement then when it's approved. Um, do understand that the board, um, excuse me, that the Amber Public Library is um, benefiting from the high bond rating of the school district. So this will be counted as debt against the school district, but it's it's not worth the the bond levy for the library covers the entire debt obligation. Are there any questions? So their their bond pricing is based on our on our rating. Yes. Okay. Very good, fortunate. Good for them. Yes. Very fortunate. <laughs> yes. And just so everyone's clear, that's because we're the fiscal agent for the library. It's considered, Amber's Public Library is considered a school library. So that is why the um, we are the fiscal agent, the district is the fiscal agent for the public library. Any other questions? None. I'll seek a motion to approve Treasurer's Recommendation 7E. Second. Second. Any more discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mr. Yakubosi? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Moving on to Superintendent's Recommendations, or report, I should say. Mr. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Snyder. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, I just wanted to thank uh, Sarah Walker, our Director of Student Services, uh, for filling in for Mr. Molmeyer. Uh, he is uh, enjoying some well-deserved uh, vacation this week, so again, Sarah, thank you for being here. And, uh, she will do a great, great job. I mean, she's looking forward to providing bites. Yeah, bites <laughs> update for him. So, uh, and then the only other thing I had is I just wanted to uh, quick update on the uh, reopening uh, plan and where we stand. I uh, wanted to highlight a couple of things. Obviously, as, as the board is aware, you know, very challenging situation you know, that we find ourselves in. And, and obviously, uh, not possible <laughs> to develop a plan that uh, everyone will, will like and will agree with. Uh, but we've tried to approach this in a way that, that's very collaborative in nature. And uh, we, we wanted to seek input and try to gather some input from our uh, families that in the community we serve and try to get a handle in terms of what most of our families uh, seem to be looking for as it relates uh, to the opening of school. And as Ms. Snyder uh, mentioned uh, in, in that opening statement there, uh, the feedback was uh, overwhelmingly that uh, families wanted to reopen school with you know, strict adherence to uh, health guidelines. 
And uh, that actually was pretty consistent uh, across all four buildings, which we thought was interesting as well. Um, especially at Powers, the numbers were highest uh, at Powers in terms of you know, favoring the return to, to the traditional uh, school day. Um, if it hadn't said that, we also know and we understand that some parents are not comfortable with that or will not be comfortable with that for many different reasons. So it was important to us as we worked through this process uh, to provide choices. And ultimately, it's, it, it's a choice for parents. We don't want to uh, impose a particular plan uh, that doesn't work for, for every family. Um, so with, with that in mind, that we are also in the process of developing an online option, uh, which will be taught by members, instructors. Uh, we don't have the exact numbers in terms of how many people will be interested in that online program. Once our detailed plans are made available later in the month, then we'll start to gather that information in terms of how many families want to take advantage of that option. From the survey, it was indicated that about 23% would be interested in an online option. So uh, again, uh, the opening of school is still five weeks away. We don't know what's going to happen with the virus. Things could be better, they could be worse, they could be very similar to what they are now. So obviously many, many variables uh, at work here. So uh, I wanted to emphasize kind of that community input piece of it because the plan that we're moving forward with uh, reflects uh, the feedback that we've received uh, from our community or the majority of our community. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, working with our staff. Uh, we've had, we began, I can remember uh, at the main board meeting, I think it was, uh, Mr. Engel, you had mentioned it's important for us to start planning in a proactive way, start looking at and brainstorming uh, different options. And our administrative team started uh, doing that in late May, early June. We've had a couple of meetings right here in this very room where we kicked around a lot of different ideas. I know Sarah's been a part of those meetings and brainstorming a lot of different scenarios. We also have had uh, two meetings with the leadership of the University of Teachers Association prior to the governor releasing his guidelines. So uh, again, working very collaboratively with our staff. And uh, one of the things that we worked through with those two meetings is that we all agree that it was going to be very important for each building uh, to kind of work collaboratively, building principal along with staff in that building to develop plans specific and unique to that building. Because we know that the arrival and dismissal, for example, is a lot different in powers than it is here at the high school. <clears throat> or in lunch is different and more than it is here at the high school. A change of classes, all those kinds of things. There's many unique characteristics and unique challenges that each building has to work through. So that's one of the things that we kind of decided when we had um, those meetings in, in June with the leadership of the Amherst Teacher Association is that we were going to rely heavily on uh, staff and uh, working together with the building principals uh, to develop those plans. So uh, that is actually in the process of happening right now. I know there have been, I think, at least one meeting at each of our four buildings. I know Mr. Kermit, our buildings and grounds supervisor, I know he was here earlier, has been involved in those meetings. Uh, the ambassador from service is, is in the loop as well. And the feedback that I'm getting from our principals is that there's some great discussion, a lot of collaborative problem solving taking place, a lot of creative ideas uh, that are, that are uh, coming out of those discussions. So those discussions are are ongoing and certainly it will keep the board posted as, as we move through that. And then of course the other piece of this is uh, direction from our local health commissioner. And I have to say that we are very, very fortunate here in Marin County. Uh, Dave Colbo and his staff in the Marin County Health Department have just been fabulous. He has taken the time and he has met with us on a weekly basis since this started back in March. Uh, every five Friday morning, all the county superintendents meet, uh, and he joins us for those meetings, as well as, I should say, uh, Representative Miller, uh, Representative uh, Manning, uh, Senator Manning, they join us for those meetings as well. So it's just been a lot of good uh, discussion. And I know many of my colleagues in other counties are somewhat jealous uh, that they don't have 
that weekly collaboration with their health commissioners in the county, in their counties, uh, that we have here in Columbia County. So our most recent meeting was this past Friday. A lot of good discussion about a lot of different topics, as you can imagine. Lunch, arrival, distancing, face coverings, recess, um, phys ed classes, music classes. I mean, just a ton of things were discussed. One of the things, uh, obviously, we, we talked about and he shared with us is that the virus doesn't uh, do as well outdoors uh, as it does indoors. So, you know, this is the time for classes and teachers to go outside, maybe extend some of those uh, recess times and, and look at utilizing the outdoors as, as much as we possibly can. So, again, he's just been a wealth of, of support and, and information for us and guidance. And he will probably have his final guidance document completed, I would think, within a week. Uh, so again, we kind of put in place this plan so that we have the survey results. We're working with staff on specific plans for each building. At the same time, we're working closely with the uh, health commissioner uh, in terms of his guidance from a health perspective. And, and frankly, you know, he's the expert. We're educators. We're not experts in public health, so that's where we rely heavily on his insights and perspectives. So, again, our hope is to pull together all of this information and then communicate more specific information and specific plans up before the end of July. And then at that point, uh, we hope to get information from our community and our families in terms of how many uh, wish to enroll in the online program and then we'll have to start working with, you know, depending on how many grade levels, those types of things, we'll work with the staffing piece of that as well. We also have already sent out a survey to our staff uh, to find out how many of our staff are interested in either teaching fully online or partially online, again, depending on what the need is. So that data is being pulled as well. So our hope is that all of this will be compiled and will come together in our next update uh, will be at the end of July at the So, again, just wanted to, you to have that information and that update and that overview. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My question on that would be is if I say I want to do online and then I've done online for a month and then say I want to go to class, are we? I, I'm sure we've addressed that in some form or fashion. So, how yeah. are we going to deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one of the things that's come up. Uh, we've talked actually about that with other districts. Uh, from what I understand, some districts are looking at like a semester uh, commitment. Uh, other districts I've heard, uh, we've kicked around the idea here of a nine week commitment. We don't, and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, it's more of an issue at the high school level where you're talking about specific semester long courses, those kind of things that would be maybe at the elementary level, it's possible it could be different based on the building. So to answer your question, yes, we talked about that, but we haven't made a final decision in terms of specifically what that guideline would be. And my follow-up to that would be that everyone's going to get a letter grade, regardless of whether they're online or in person. Yes. We, we, the online program, we've talked again about that extensively, will look different than what it did obviously uh, this past spring. We, we were all kind of thrust into it very quickly and uh, our staff just did a wonderful job of adapting, adjusting, and kind of making the best of a very unusual situation. As the board is aware, we passed some resolutions that gave us flexibility in grading because our focus was first and foremost on, on the health and the social and emotional well-being of our students. Uh, but looking at this year, Obviously, with more time to plan, the grading and expectations for that online program would be much different than what they were this past spring. Great. I In your discussion with the Lorain County Health Group and our, our own staff, we have certain areas of the district and every single building that are frontline. I'll call them frontline team. Okay, for example, in, in this main lobby here, everybody coming in is usually hitting Marie or right here at the desk, okay, or your secretaries, Jan, people like Jan. What, what consideration has anyone given to putting up those plastic shields? It seems like everywhere you go, doctors.
doctor's offices, wherever they have plastic shields put up at the front line. Those are the people who are going to be those that are going to get exposed first. So there's any consideration of putting up these shields it's in the RV is strategic area in every one of our buildings. Yeah, that's one of the things that actually has come up in our building meetings. Uh, Chuck and I actually just talked about it again today, I'm looking at because if you're aware the, the offices or uh, the greeting area, if you will, is different. It is. It's so different here at the high school versus what it is maybe at the Powers Building or more or the junior high or the secretaries or, for example, the secretary of junior high, the secretaries are a little bit uh, back further uh, from the front counter. So again, I think what we're going to do is uh, Chuck, myself, and principal will take a look at each office area and do what we need to do in each space you know, to make it obvious. Here's, you've got two places here, right here, lane model. Then when you get into the main office, you have another area right there. Each each building is is, is different, but that's, you know, so that's one of the things that's, that's come up. It's very common that you see this, obviously, in offices and, and stores. Uh, you know, we have, we have a son that he's working a part-time at Dollar General. Of course, they have those, and so he's experienced that from a, you know, from a worker standpoint. So, uh, yeah, it's just a lot of things are being discussed. In fact, I got somebody yesterday share with me, they said, you know, Steve, it seems like we solved one problem or answer one one question and figure out how we're going to do something, and, and then two or two or three others kind of surface. So uh, it, it's going to be it's going to evolve, and, and I have to say that a big part of this plan will be yes, we'll have a plan at the end of July, you know, first part of August, but at the same time we have to be ready to adjust and adapt because we don't know. Uh, what it's going to look like in mid-September. We don't know what it's going to look like in, in November. And there's just there's so many variables, there's so many, there's so many things that we don't have control over. What we're trying to do is focus on the things that we do have control over. And as I have a teacher just share with me last night, he said, see, we've got a lot of great people who are very passionate about EMRs, about our students and our families, about our communities, and together we will figure it out. And uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's what this is all about. Our staff is our greatest resource in terms of working through these kinds of problems. They're on the front lines, and uh, they know the day in, day out challenges of, of their particular job, and we're working uh, hand in hand with them. And, and again, there's a lot of things. I sent out a tweet today. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that I really appreciate about our staff. Uh, but probably at the top of the list, and, and the board is aware of this, uh, the ability to collaboratively and creatively problem solve and deal with adversity is probably at the top of the list. I, we can talk about example after example. The day the boy first went out uh, over here, powers, and we had to evacuate the building, and the little ones came over here to, to the high school, and just example after example. So, uh, we'll get through it. We've got a great bunch here in Amherst and collaboratively we put our minds together uh, we'll figure it out. But yeah, they, there's many and there's so many things that have come up and we just, we don't have all the answers yet, but we're trying to work through them all the time. Okay, and then I thought you were talking, has, has the school calendar come up at all? Like changing it? Like the colleges are talking about like not having like going back after, I mean, we would do the same thing, but something of that sort, like a lot of the colleges aren't going back after Thanksgiving. They don't want to send all the kids home and then everybody come back again. Yeah, from what I understand, the colleges, some of them are starting earlier and finishing a Thanksgiving and then they're hoping to have that five, six week period before uh, you know, the kids come back in January. We, we haven't talked about that yet here. I mean, there's been some conversation among superintendents in the county about potential changes in the school calendars. And of course, we all have different calendars anyway based on a lot of different you know, factors. Some of us are starting you know, August 20th, you know, within a day or two. Others are starting after Labor Day. Others are starting the last week of August. So as of right now, we're planning on starting August the 20th. But again, that could change. And we'll just have to kind of work with that, and then I'll, I'll keep you posted as we work our way through. I think given, given the time it could take to secure these plastic shields and then get them up, given the time we have left, five weeks, I think that's a decision we got to make quickly. Mm -hmm. If we're going to do it, we have to pull the trigger. Yeah, Chuck and I were just talking about There's a guy in the that can make it. Yeah. We, and we've actually had, as you can imagine, 
lots of emails from a lot of companies looking to sell various products and you know, trying to sort through and what's the best value and, and that type of thing. So. As a follow up to the, what he's not, we're not talking about there, uh, I'm sure we've talked about limiting the amount of people that will be allowed to come through our doors. Yes. Yeah, that's one of the things that visitors, however, visitors and vendors. Yeah, vendors. There's just so many different open houses come up. You know, they, this may not be the year where they have open houses as we're used to having open houses. Um, you know, obviously big crowds of people and, and that type of thing. So it impacts uh, so many different things. And yeah, we've even, you know, one of the ideas that's, that's come up again, not finalized, not part of the plan, but you know, one of the suggestions. Uh, that's come out um, from some of our staff is that maybe when somebody comes in, they call, and then we take the child out to the car, out to mom and dad's car, versus having mom and dad come in. Um, and of course, trying to use many meetings and that kind of thing, the online, so that, that type of thing, can limit, uh, obviously, as much as possible to those in the building, uh, to students and staff. So, again, just a lot of things that we're looking at. None of it finalized at this point, um, but uh, we're going to do our best. In, in your discussions with county health partners, so on, what what kind of, what, what kind of considerations are given to any kind of testing that we would do here? For example, people coming in, are we going to take temperatures? Is every student coming in every day going to be checked before they're allowed in the building? I mean, there's, I mean, I, I sat down this afternoon thought of a million different things and as so I answered I asked myself one question and all of a sudden it dominated with about 10, 10 to 12 different other scenarios and said, geez, you know, if there is testing, who pays for it? If someone tests positive, say a teacher tests positive, and the teacher, the teacher has 100 students, those, those 100 students now have to get quarantined and tested. I mean, it, it just drives them sitting there thinking, kind of sick and blow up into a mess. Yeah, and, and there, there's so much that the symptom assessment is, is one, obviously, one of the big things that the health commissioner is, is looking at now being his final guidance, which comes out this week. But, you know, the idea of you know, checking temperatures of students as they come in, is that feasible and practical when you start thinking about the people lining up and that type of thing. And, again, we're, one of the things we're looking at is trying to, again, partner with families. To, to look at doing a lot of this symptom assessment uh, at home uh, before the child comes to school. And again, the health commissioner I know has, has uh, guidance and recommendations that he's going to come out with. Um, but there's just a lot of different things. I one of the things you have mentioned is that we're trying to minimize uh, one of the things that's come up in buildings instead of having the students move to different rooms throughout the building is that we would have staff to obviously, you know, students come in, they're going to take a room to try to keep them there as much as possible. And it seems to make sense to have maybe different teachers rotating in that room versus moving students uh, from place to place uh, during the day. So, again, you can imagine the logistics. Uh, but again, I have to say, our principals, our staff, our support staff, I just talked to Maura Hicks, our Hopsey president this afternoon. Uh, she was going to give me an update on some things. It's just a matter of pulling together and, and we'll figure it out. There's just there's so many different things, and but people are working so hard uh, during their vacation time uh, to, to make things happen and make sure we're ready for our hearts. But again, uh, on behalf of our staff, I, I can say that we're going to do the best. I have one more question, Steve. On the you took you took about the Lorraine County superintendents. So would you envision, and I know you can't tell me the details, but would you envision that people would find similar plans in the Lorraine County schools? Because I know some people have compared what our school's going to do to, you know, other schools in other, you know, areas. I mean, it seems like each one's going to be so individualized, it's going to be hard to compare you know, every school. Right, and that, the, the idea was, and that's a great question, the idea was for, for the superintendents to come together with the health commissioner and come up with some guidance that, that could help all districts. Um, and, and so that's the kind of process that we've been involved with, and Dave, as I mentioned, is in the process of putting together that final document. Because there are certain principles and certain ideas and guidance that apply to everyone regardless of grade, regardless of what district building, 
But then again, there are so many uniquenesses uh, from district to district in terms of, for example, buildings. Build every district's facility situation is different in terms of you know, class sizes, square footage. There's just so many different variables. But that was the idea is to, to come up with some things that that kind of apply to everybody, but at the same time, there has to be latitude for different districts to do what makes sense for their district and their community. So I think you'll see some similarities across districts in Lorain County, but by no means I don't think that everyone will be doing the same thing. I think there will be differences across the county. Anything else, Mr. Sears? Need a break? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Are there any um, administrative reports to cover tonight? That's all I can. Mr. Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I changed my hair. <laughs> I know, right? I must say it looks really nice. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you guys for letting me um, be here and sitting sitting at the table today. I do have a couple things I want to touch on. One of them involves in um, later in the agenda under educational recommendations. I'm asking you to please approve the Amherst Online um, Academy Handbook. And I want to take a minute to kind of clarify this is separate than any um, reentry online options that we're talking about when we talk about what is our reopening plan. Um, Amherst Online has been around for several years. We've had this handbook that's kind of been a work in progress as we're working on um, our policies and procedures for the program. But really, it's been an alternative program for students who it, it's got options for K through 12, but it's been primarily used in our upper grades for credit recovery for students who are out for medical, you know, short period, long period of time. Um, we've used it as discipline options so that if students make poor choices, um, during the school day, they can still continue on with their education using this, this online option. When we're looking at our remote learning with our re-entry, we're looking at Amherst teachers with, you know, Clark's kind of speaking to what you had asked is, that way they're staying connected with the teachers in the building. And so whenever, whether it's after a quarter or after a semester, whenever they come back, they're still connected with those teachers and with, with the students within the building. So it's not the same when we talk about our online options for our re-entry. The Amherst uh, Online Academy is not, not the same thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, touch base with you on is Amherst will be hosting a second harvest drive through mobile food pantry on July 30th. This is going to be from 4 to 6 at the junior high. And we are, our district social worker, Jill Mayorka, has been working um, behind the scenes this summer trying to bring one of these to our area. It will have frozen meats. It will have non-perishables. It will have produce that folks can drive up and pick up. The, you may have seen the, the second harvest has had a few of these around the county um, over the past few months. And this one we are doing with a partnership with the Amherst Police Department, with Lorain County Education Service Center, Second Harvest, the National Guard will be there. So it's really going to be a, a nice opportunity for, for our families locally to um, get some needed support. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I knew you yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> would. I knew you would. <laughs> so I like sitting what, next to you. What is, you know, what would be my role if I didn't have that? As far as the College Plus program, mm -hmm. I'm sure that you will like have been working with community college yes. to make sure that that will all come together, whether it be, you know, because a lot of times our students travel there, so that, I'm sure their impact will be looking at all online classes or they're going to do a combination is playing into that. Um, I just know that there are some parent concerns that will their students be able to earn as many college credits as we have earned in the past because I think that they know that our students have earned more college credits in the county than any other mm -hmm. school district. Right. So I just want to make sure that that communication is open and we're going to clearly make sure that the 
juniors and seniors, which is basically to take those courses, are going to not lose out in any sure. Well, and that's going to be the important thing, you know, in talking about, do you think you answer one question and then several more pop up, is we offer a lot of variety for our students, and that's that's one of the trickiest things about trying to figure out all these free entry plans, is we don't want our kids to miss out on anything more than they may have missed out on in the spring, and so providing all those opportunities. So it's, it's, it's working with all the partners to make sure that that's taken care of. I would be happy to take that back to Mr. Molnar, <laughs> so that way he can get back to you on what the plans are for that. <laughs> well, I'm sure that they'll be outlined. They will. So I had a couple of people asking about that because they have seniors, and they said, you know, we need to make sure that they're going to be able to get those college credits because when they apply to school, they go into the status of a sophomore versus a freshman, and that's a big deal to them. Yeah. You know, from that perspective, so I just wanted to. To kind of hear how community college is working with us because sometimes the college, the courses that are taking them from community college, they're taking partnerships, right. they're taking them from Bowling Green, they're taking them from somewhere else. So I just think, you know, it's a whole different element that we've never worried about because when they could go there, they were getting educated from Kent versus community college. And, and I know a lot of our teachers also do instruction for the College Plus program through, through community right. college. So I just wanted to to hear kind of what the thought process was, and I kind of thought maybe you wouldn't have all of those answers. <laughs> but I, at least Mike can yes. research them for next time. He will month. research them and then get back to you. Okay, great. Anyone else? I have a question. Okay. Going back to the food drive, mm -hmm. yes. do, do you have to register for that, or just people show up? They, so Second Harvest started the registry recently with the, the last few that they've had. And, and so they're kind of piloting the registration. Um, I'm not sure if it will still be in place. They've got a couple of mobile food pantries happening before ours, but we've got some preliminary flyers that will be going out, and then they're going to let us know if we're going to need to do a registration for it. And that, is that for just the community or anybody? That's anybody. And from what I've heard, there were, um, our social worker was at the one on Saturday, I can't remember where it was, but she said there were several folks from the Amherst zip code that had, had registered and, and gone through the line there. So I know they're accessing these, and so it's just nice for us to be able to bring it home and then not have to make so much of a drive. Thank you. Can you tell us your name? Kenny Walker Noyes, I'm Pastor at Heritage Presbyterian. We use Second Harvest for a pantry drive. We're using a trunk pantry right now, so everything gets placed in the trunk. But they use a pantry track program mm -hmm. that uh, can register on the spot. Yes. And it's all done compute with the computer. I do it on my cell phone when we have our monthly pantry at the church. So it's quick, it's easy, nobody has to get out of the car. So right at the car window, just drive over. Just to clarify. Okay, thank you. And I know they had me sign up for training, so I'm assuming that's what they... I can show it to you right now. Okay, I'd love to see it. So, I'm glad you're here. Your name was again? Jenny Walker Noise and a Thank you, I appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm finished. Okay. Are you finished with me? Anybody else? I'm finished. John is trying so hard. Uh, I'll just reserve my comments at the end. Yeah. Uh, JBS. Needless to say, we are working through uh, some of the same issues, but we in a little bit different scale uh, in regards to reopening. Um, we will have a board meeting this week um, to talk about some of those things because. The lab component is where we're struggling. So I think you'll probably see more of the four things coming online. This is just my interpretation of what I know we discussed. It hasn't been a little clear in any form or fashion yet. But I think you'll see more of the regular curriculum classwork being done online. And then people going to school probably two or three days and alternating those days from a lab standpoint. Just because they happen, we can't teach welding online, okay? So instead of having lab every day, they may have a whole day or so of lab. So that's being worked on uh, from that perspective. So um, I'm sure there will be some more discussion of that here in the evening. Uh, the other thing, the final vote on the levy, 
which will hit the ballot in November. Um, it'll be a 10 year, uh, 0.66 mills for each hundred dollars of valuation uh, from that perspective for permanent improvement, which has been on the ballot before. There's been a lot of debate and discussion, but the board, the board did decide to move forward for putting that on the ballot in November. So stay tuned for the exciting. Sure, we'll tell you that. Uh, any other questions for me? Okay. So. You move on to personnel recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Uh, I know the board's had an opportunity to review these items. Just wanted to draw attention to a couple of these items. Uh, I wanted to mention here in support is where Nikki Campbell, uh, one of our assistant principals here at the high school, received a nice opportunity to become the director of pupil services with the Keystone Schools. And uh, Nikki was only with us for a year. Uh, but we know that when we hire uh, good people and talented people, they're going to get other opportunities. And uh, after just one year, Nikki earned this opportunity at Keystone, a really nice opportunity for her uh, professionally. Obviously, we're going to miss her, but uh, just a nice, a nice professional opportunity for her. We actually had, I was thinking about this uh, earlier today, three of our building administrators over the last three years have earned promotions to central office positions in other districts. Uh, as you may remember, Bill Miller became the director of personnel with uh, South Euclid uh, Lindhurst, and Mike May, our high school principal, became the director of personnel for the Heights, and then, of course, here. Nikki Campbell with the uh, Director of Pupil Services at Keystone. So that tells me that we're hiring the right people. And uh, when they have those opportunities to, to, to go on and, and move into other uh, professional growth positions, it's a good thing. Fortunately, uh, we are able to <laughs> replace these folks with equally the talented folks. And with that in mind, I wanted to draw attention to item C. Uh, Tony, many of you know, has been a fourth grade teacher for us and uh, has just done an outstanding job and it's uh, our recommendation that he uh, fill the assistant principal position here at uh, Steel High School. The position was only open a couple of weeks and we had well over 50 applicants, 15 applicants for screen online, uh, six in-person interviews, three interviewed as finalists and Nick emerged as that person. And I, I just wanted to say too, one of the things that we talked about during the, the process is as we look at candidates, administrative candidates, is how they would respond in a situation like we're in now. It's one thing to be in a leadership position when all is going well. And it's, you just kind of move things along. But when you're in the midst of diversity and when you're in the midst of dealing with significant challenges, you know, that is when true leadership really emerges. And so as we talked about that with Nick, I mean, he is such a positive guy. He doesn't focus on problems. He focuses on solutions. You know, it's one thing to identify a problem. Anybody can do that. It's another thing to figure out a solution to that problem. And that's one of the things that stood out you know, with Nick is that he's a problem solver. You know, he's calm. He's level-headed. He's positive. He just brings so much to the table. And I will say also very, very community oriented. Very community oriented. So uh, again, just a pleasure to be able to recommend uh, Nick Tony as our next assistant principal. I did check with Mr. Tellier today, and from what I found out, Nick is actually, because I didn't know he would be here tonight, he's on his way back from Michigan, I think. He's been out of town for the weekend. So we're hoping to have him maybe come to our August for a meeting. So if we can uh, we can say hello to him kind of officially at that meeting. And then the last item, F, this is kind of an unusual item, again, related to the re uncertainty of the reopening, is that obviously all sports very much up in the air at this point. We're hearing that we could get some guidance before the end of the week from the OHSAA. They had some changes there. Their executive director resigned. So they're in transition with their executive director. So this it's you know, kind of some, some tough things, obviously, that they're dealing with down there. So we don't know. Are we going to have fall sports or not? If we do start the fall sports season, will we, will we be able to complete the fall sports season? Or will it end in September, October, 
whatever. Uh, so given that the fall sports season typically starts that first of August, but their practices, that's when the official season starts, and our next board meeting isn't until August the, I think it's the 10th, this pending your approval, this resolution would give us the ability, Amy and I, to work out a memorandum of understanding with our teachers association in terms of compensation for our fall coaches. And of course, once that is finalized, once we know what's happening, we would uh, obviously bring that back to the board. So that is a kind of an unusual recommendation. But again, the situation we're in, timing of everything, wanted you to have that rationale. Uh, again, and that was something that was actually recommended by our attorney. Rather than wait, we kind of thought it was a good idea to kind of proactively uh, put this in place. Uh, let's see here. I'd like to recommend items 10A through 10F. Second. Discussion? In regards to fall sports. Yes, sir. Um, let's assume that we're going to have fall sports. We're going to play football. How are we controlling the audience? How are we controlling the spectators? What are we going to do in terms of social distancing? I'm sure the athletic department is on that and has a plan in place, but that will become a hot button, especially for the spectators who don't have someone playing ball. So have we any thoughts to that yet? We've talked about that. We've had preliminary conversations. We've heard that there may be capacity limits to stadiums, a certain percentage of what the capacity is. We've talked about online ticketing. We've, again, talked about a lot of different things, waiting to see if we have fall sports. One of the things I just heard over the weekend is that, one again, just speculation. One of the possible <coughs> scenarios is that fall and spring sports could be switched. Spring sports could, traditional spring sports could take place in the fall. All sports could take place in the spring. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that's one of the things Some that we've heard. Some of the junior colleges are moving in that direction. We've also heard that there's a good chance we won't have fall sports. So we, we've, we've heard all kinds of different things, but we really need direction. You know, from the Ohio High School Athletic Association sooner rather than later. And, uh, so, so that we can deal with some of those kinds of issues. So are we dealing at, with marching band as a sport, or are we dealing with it some other way, and is it happening? Well, that would be, I would assume, if we didn't have fall sports, we probably uh, wouldn't have marching band. But again, but if we do, let's assume we're having yes. it, how are we going to transport, or are we not transporting to a way game? Those are the kind of questions that I should be interested in because, you know, we take how many buses for the band now? Are we going to have to take triple that number of buses? Or what are we going to have to do to make that happen? Are we taking everybody? I mean, are we taking the drum corps? I mean, are we going to the flag corps and all of those people? Or are way games? Are they just not going? It's just the band. I just think that those are questions that are going to start surfacing because it's going to be happening. I've had that twice and it's just a call. No. Certainly, being things happening because you know those are long, hard days. Right, and being things that normally start the first part of August. So those are just I just yeah. Matt, I know you're working on all that, but I just think that you know we talk about the sports, but we got to remember that the arts people too yes. have some concerns about some of that yes. kind of stuff. Well. Yeah, whole transportation. I think that our county needs. We have spent a lot of time talking about transportation. How do you social distance on a bus? Some, some, some of the ideas are that you know, it's just it's, it's almost impossible uh, to social distance on a bus. So maybe, of course, you get into possible scenarios with face coverings and you know those kinds of things. But just a lot of different things, and, and that also applies to athletics and meeting and anything where we're transporting uh, the students. So yeah, well, and, and I would have concerns with transporting the football. Yes, you know I don't have I don't have problems transporting the tennis players. We can social distance. Them. Yeah. How do we How do we make sixty guys not be on top of each other, you know, shoulder to shoulder for the most part on a bus? And they're not going to be. They're going to get on their sweat. And they're going to get on their hot and yucky and mucky after they play ball. 
because you know darn well they're not going to put on a mask. And then I just think that that is more of a, a concern of mine than them playing ball. You know, just getting them there and getting them back. Absolutely. So those are concerns that I think that we need to make sure that when we do announce whether they're ready to have or not, that we make sure we have all of that stuff completely outlined. You know, because if, if it's going to be that, well, gee, we will provide busing, but if the parent wants to drive, I mean, swim people, parents drive a lot of times, correct? You know, some of those kind of things. So we have to be concerned in, in what kind of waivers and liability yes. issues do we have and to be concerned with. Yeah, and probably what will happen is even uh, addressing our regular transportation to and from school. We'll probably end up with a set of guidelines that, that uh, obviously we develop in conjunction with the health department and some parents may or may not be comfortable with that. We were kind of surprised that the survey, the number of folks said, yeah, we're fine with, uh, you know, with uh, you know, transporting our children on the bus. Others, not so much. And, you know, they may want you know, choose to uh, you know, drop their children off at school or whatever, but the same thing with athletics. You know, we have to be flexible there and get our whole idea throughout this whole reopening process is to give parents choices so that they're not uh, feeling like they have to do something. If they don't feel comfortable with the bus guidelines, then there's an alternative. Or if they're not comfortable sending their child to school, uh, then there's an alternative. So uh, I, I do apologize that I don't have all that. Oh, we're just that, yes. I don't want us to come out with half of it. I want us right. to come out with all of it. So when we say we're going to do this, we're going to do we're going to do football, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're not doing any of it, that's okay too. But whatever we do, let's make sure that we get everybody, any question that we possibly can think of that a parent's going to ask, that we have an answer. Yeah, as much as we possibly can. Possibly can, because they're going to think of something that we haven't thought of. Yes. A sure as shoot. And then what are we going to do? So I just want us to have thought that, and I know you brainstormed that. And, um, well, and that's why we really need, Casey and I just talked about this, so we really need direction. From the employees and say, hey, you know, we received the direction on July 2nd from the governor in regards to school reopening, but you know, here we are, it's July 13th, and we still don't have a decision on fall sports, which are technically supposed to start practicing in about, what, two and a half weeks. So we need that direction. And sometimes that direction is pretty big. Yes. <laughs> so that's why it's going to create more questions. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's very big. Because I deal with that same thing every day also, and it's very big. So you have to, or we have to, in this case, the school district has to establish what we're going to do, and then get that approved by the health commissioner, and the health community is okay. So that's why I think it's important that I, I don't think what they're going to give us is one, two, three, A, B, and C. I just don't see that. I think, oh, here's a generic statement, and right. right. how you want, right. Right. and then you do. Bottom line is, but there, there's no playbook on this. There is no playbook. Nobody has it. <laughs> and and we, can, we can sit here and brainstorm all day long and do the best, which is what we're doing. We're going to have a plan. <coughs> right. okay, and that plan can be absolute garbage the very next day. You Absolutely. Okay. We don't know what this virus is going to do. We have no clue. All we can do is plan as best we can, which we're doing. I commend those people who are spending all the time and effort to try to think of what you might think of or what they might think of. We can't possibly we'll never come up with all the answers. There's no one answer, there's no playbook, and I think that if we take anything out of here tonight, the bottom line is we let everybody, the parents, the children, all of our students, our teachers, our staff, everybody, the key, the key to this to me is flexibility. We've got to be able to be flexible and, and make decisions as quickly as we can, give the information that we have. The guidelines are nothing more than guidelines. They're not rules, they're guidelines, okay? So, the bottom line is, whatever you're thinking about today, I guarantee it's gonna oh, change it's okay. tomorrow. It's gonna to change tomorrow. Just be flexible. That's all we can do. And if you don't like it, hey, you got a better idea? We'll listen. If not, it is what it is. Deal with it. And then to go on with some of that stuff that Rex is talking about, their budgets are gonna flex. I mean, if they're, if we used to go on three buses and now we have to go on six or eight buses, 
we're going to have a lot more well, bus that's drivers. What I'm that's and cool. the ticket, you know, at the ticket counter, all of that you cost. can't have all the people there, and then Casey's not going to have the intake right. um, of dollars. A lot of implications. Yeah. A lot of implications. Do you see the trend or whatever? I mean, are they going to allow people to want, or do you think they're going to just like they did? Another sports set it down where they're going to play, but play in front of nobody. Yeah, I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Everybody, and, and I think this made this change in the executive director at the OHSA uh, certainly has not helped uh, in terms of right in the middle of this thing. You have a change in leadership there. You know, it's just, I can't, you know, that, that's just further complicated the situation, but we just don't know. Steve, and just one thing you had mentioned on um, ticketing before, and I just want everyone to hear it. We have had difficulties in the state with some of the companies that sell online ticketing. So we need to be really careful to make sure that we're dealing with a reputable entity if we go that route. <laughs> it's a lot. Do we have a, do we have like an occupancy number of the stadium. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that you yep. just say, hey, you know, if you've got 300, you're allowed to some more. Excellent. Yeah. That's one of the things we've heard in fall sports were to happen, that there's only some capacity. Well, and, and probably it's going to be there. Because if you have band kids and you have football kids, right. you're going to fill the stadium. Right. So it's oh, not yeah. going to be general right. public. Right. Parents, which is who I think should be, should be right. Yes. You know, if you've got a son or a daughter that's in one of the races, right? Should be the absolute priority. Priority. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Not, absolutely. not Tim Smith, who his cousin played five years ago. I mean, I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm just right. saying, no. that if right. it was your kid and they were on that field and doing this stuff, you know, I mean, there's a scene that perform no matter what. Absolutely. Okay. We have a motion in a second. We do. And we got into discussion. And now I think we're ready for the roll call. Sure. Mr. Zappa. Aye. Mrs. Gillis. Aye. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Yakabogi. Aye. Mrs. Meyer. Aye. Brother, we're in Mr. Sayers for your next thing. <laughs> educational. Yeah. <laughs> educational recommendation. I'm going like, to educate this. I guess it's not my turn. I want my turn to be finished. <laughs> Actually, most of these are serious. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, it's great to have you here. That's also true. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, I know the board's had an opportunity to review these. As you recognize, most of these items are things that uh, we approve on an annual basis, uh, contracts for uh, our students with special needs. And most of what you uh, see here, that, that's what we're looking at. We do have uh, the online academy handbook, which Sarah uh, provided that update, and then also uh, photography uh, agreements. That was a process that was led by Mr. Molar and building principles and a recommendation there for those contracts. So with that, we'd like to recommend approval of items 11A through 11J. Mr. Dapasek. Any discussion? Here we go. Um, hey, did, did we not have a problem? That's that same question. <laughs> For uh, this company, for, 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 for the pictures. Yes, we, and we, they had conversation, the committee had conversation about that because I think it was in fall, fall sports, right? Yeah, sure. as I recall. Volleyball was big. Volleyball, golf, I want to say, was yeah. in it. There were, and this was a topic of conversation, and it, of course, it was addressed you know, during that process, and it was a consensus among the principals that this was the direction that they wanted to go. In fact, I think Casey was also involved. Uh, and, and it is only for this year. Yes. Because it was a, with, with everything that was going on, it was discussion that was happening during all of the um, closures and things. And so this one, if I remember correctly, is just this, this school year only. With them, we were going to. And part of that was mm -hmm. making sure, hopefully, mm -hmm. that this, this, this uh, fall sports uh, situation. Improves, yes. right? And if not, <laughs> right. don't get that. We're going to come back next year. I'm obviously looking at that direction. 
I think that's a great point. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, sir. So it does come from we don't have all sports for the game, sir. Yeah, well, that was, uh, <laughs> and they can't come back and see if we did it right. Yeah, no, that's correct. Right. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Mr. Yakubosi? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mrs. Bellis? Aye. Mrs. Meyer? Aye. And then business recommendations? Yeah, just the one I never liked to recommend approval for item 12A. Second. 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 See, my email, I forwarded an email to you from Harry Bean. Yeah, I got it too. We all got it. See, all got it. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, I couldn't see what you all got. No, me so either. Yeah, yeah, so I forwarded it. So I just wanted to make sure that the right Steve, I, I, it was all must have been sent individually or yeah, other copy should. because I didn't see anybody else in the So, okay. So I said something to him too. Right. Yeah, I think I see where I took care of it. You probably got one too. Yeah. But okay. I wanted the board to be aware that I didn't respond. And he had asked about purchasing a portion of the shoe property, and I had indicated that at this time uh, we'd like to hold off on doing that because we're not sure of our long term plans uh, for that property. So I did follow up and I did email him this afternoon. Perfect. I just, I mean, yeah, you couldn't tell. Who I couldn't tell, so I thought, well, I'm going to text you. That's why I was getting a message. Yeah, well, I was going to text you. I assume you want a piece of the property that abuts his property. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you're. That's a, that's a process, believe me. Yes, I know. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. good. So you responded? Yes. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So I would like to um, adjourn to executive session to discuss the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of public employees with no action to be taken. So. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Gillis. Mr. Yakubosi. Mr. Engel, Mr. Zappa, Mrs. Nyer. Thank you.